Limitations of Liability and Exclusion Clauses. In this podcast, I will introduce you to the scope for limiting or excluding liability for breach of contract as a term of the contract itself. I will also give you an approach to considering issues of exclusion. As a starting point, consider the notion of freedom to contract. If parties of equal bargaining power want to restrict or limit their liability, there is no obvious reason why they should not be permitted to do so. Conversely, where the parties are not in a position of equal bargaining power, a stronger party forcing a weaker party to accept a position of limited recourse in the event of a breach by a stronger party is of questionable fairness, and it seems appropriate for the law to prevent such an abusive position. I will approach the issues of exclusion and limitation in three steps, although, as usual, each step has a number of sub-points to it. The first step is to ask whether the clause is incorporated into the contract. If it is not, then neither party can rely on it. The second step is that if the clause is incorporated into the contract, you need to examine whether, on a correct construction, it covers the issue in question. And the third step is to question whether it falls within a statutory limitation on exclusion clauses, preventing a party from relying on it. I have included in the notes a link to a piece on the website of the Society for Computers and Law on limitations of liability and exclusion clauses, and if you have access, I would strongly suggest taking a look at it. The first step of the analytical framework I've suggested is considering the issue of incorporation. There are three ways in which a term can be incorporated into a contract. By signature, by notice, by course of dealing. And I'll step through each of these in turn. In terms of incorporation by signature, where the parties have signed a contract which ex includes an exclusion clause, that exclusion clause is likely to have been incorporated into the contract. As you may remember from the podcast on mistake, signing a contract without reading it is unlikely to appeal to the courts as a reason to, to overturn it. So just because you haven't read a contract and you subsequently find it contains an exclusion clause, it is highly unlikely you'll be able to overturn it on that basis. However, there are some situations in which despite two parties having entered clearly into a contract, a signature may not be binding. For example, where the other party to a contract has made an express but incorrect representation as to what is contained in the contract, and the claiming party has relied on this. See the case of Curtis and the Chemical Cleaning Company. The second means of incorporation is incorporation by notice. At the very beginning of the course, I said that the vast majority of contracts are not required to be in writing to be effective, and indeed, in day-to-day -day life, few contracts entail the creation of a document and a signature of the parties. This does not mean that an exclusion clause cannot be incorporated into such a contract. Where there is no signed contract, an exclusion clause may still be validly incorporated, where reasonable notice of its existence is given by the reliant party before the contract is, is concluded. The leading case on incorporation by notice is an old one, and that of Parker and the South East Railway. In this case, a man left for storage a bag in a cloakroom. There was a sign on the cloakroom wall limiting the company's liability, and this statement was repeated on the back of a ticket which was handed to, a man, handed to the man after he paid his money. The bag was lost, and the man sought to reclaim the full cost of the bag and its contents. The railway company argued that contractually they had limited their liability. The Court of Appeal held that where reasonable steps had been taken to draw the existence of the clause to the attention of the party, it would be incorporated. Note that only the existence of the clause needed to have been notified, not its precise contents. In the case of Parker, I would question whether, if there had been no sign on the cloakroom wall, the court would have found that the notice would have been incorporated. The man had argued that the ticket he'd received after handing over the money was just a receipt, and so evidence of a contract, and thus too late an opportunity to try to include anything in the contract itself. I have sympathy for this argument, 
but the presence of the sign also containing the clause seems very important here. From Parker, we can surmise there are three requirements for a notice to be a valid incorporation of a term. First, the clause must be contained in a contractual document. Second, notice must have been brought to the attention of the party before the contract was concluded. And thirdly, the notice must have been reasonable in how it was drawn to the party's attention. Let me talk through each of these three requirements of incorporation by notice in turn. The first is that for a term to be incorporated into a contract, it must be contained in a contractual document. This need not be as formal as a signed contract, and simply including it on a notice board is sufficient. See the case of Thornton and Shoe Lane Parking. However, it does require that the notice board is genuinely readable. See the case of McCutcheon and McBrain, in which it was not sufficiently clear. The requirement is that the clause is contained in a contractual document. So something which appears to be a receipt for payment, i.e. evidence of a contract, not a document containing contractual terms itself, is insufficient. See the case of Chapleton and Barry and the receipt for the hire of a deck chair. The second requirement is that the term must be notified before the contract is concluded. And the classic case on this point is that of Ollie and Marlborough Court Hotel, in which defendants attempted to rely on an exclusion clause consisting of a notice on a wall on one of their guest hotel bedrooms. The Court of Appeal held that the notice would need to have been displayed prominently at reception, i.e. at the point the party was entering into a contract, for it to have contractual effect. The second requirement is whether the party trying to rely on the notice did what it was reasonable to do to bring the notice to the attention of the other party. There are two strands of cases to consider. The first strand includes what are known as the railway cases, since they deal with notices contained within railway tickets. The second is the situation where a term is particularly unusual or onerous. Looking first at the railway cases, in Thompson and London Midland and Scottish Railway, the railway company attempted to incorporate within a contract a clause trying to exclude liability for personal injury caused by negligence on the basis that there was wording on a ticket, and the wording on the ticket said, for conditions, see back, and on the reverse of the ticket was a direction that the ticket was subject to conditions set out in the company's timetable. To see the full terms, you had to buy the timetable, and the timetable had an additional, not insubstantial cost. Perhaps surprisingly, the court held that the exclusion clause, which was printed only in a document which had to be bought separately, referenced in quite understated language on the back of a ticket, was sufficient to exclude liability for personal injury caused through negligence. This seems a perhaps surprising decision to me, so I would strongly suggest that you make sure you read through the case and try and understand the basis on which the court came to that conclusion. It does remain good law, although if it were decided today, statutory limitations on what can and can't be excluded would likely lead to a rather different result. The second category of cases is those to do with onerous terms and where an exclusion clause is particularly unreasonable or on onerous, the reliant party must go to extra efforts to make sure that the existence of the clause is drawn to the attention of the other party. One of the classic quotations of contract law, that of Lord Justice Denning in the case of Sperling and Bradshaw, is that some clauses which I have seen would need to be printed in red ink on the face of the document, with a red hand pointing to it, before the notice could be held to be sufficient. This rule has, unsurprisingly, become known as the Red Hand Rule. Applying this rule in the case of a claim brought against a mechanical parking system, which caused injury to a driver using a car park, the Court of Appeal ruled in the case of Thornton and Shoe Lane Parking that an exclusion for personal injury, which was contained only on notices placed on pillars in the car park, was insufficient, since the contract was concluded at the point of entry to the car park, and that a clause of this seriousness required the most explicit 
notice. If those three tests are satisfied, that the notice was included in a contractual document, provided before the contract was concluded, and the reliant party took reasonable steps to draw the existence of the clause to the notice of the other party, the exclusion clause will have been incorporated validly into the contract by notice. The third means of incorporation, the last one that we will look at, is incorporation through course of dealing. And the basic principle is that even if a notice was not drawn to the attention of the party in this particular instance, because the party had had the notice drawn to its attention in the past, they are bound by it. This approach is reliant on there being a consistent course of previous dealings, and a frequency or regularity to them. Thus, if previous course of dealings has been inconsistent, for example that you were sometimes given a notice with terms and sometimes not, it cannot be said that there was a course of dealing which introduced or incorporated the terms into the contract, and that was the situation in McCutcheon and McBrain, where the ferry company was unable to prove that there was sufficient consistency to the previous dealings to incorporate a term simply by course of dealing alone. If you've been able to establish that the term is incorporated into the contract, the next stage is to determine whether, on a true construction of the contract, the clause covers the breach. The general approach to construction of contracts is set out by Lord Wilberforce in the Investors' Compensation Scheme case. I'm not going to read it out, it's five paragraphs long, and I suggest that you read it for yourself. It is the five numbered paragraphs in the speech of Lord Wilberforce in the case which I've linked in the materials. I have also included a link to an article from the Society for Computers and Law, which appears to be available without access, access restriction. It's well worth taking a look at. However, in terms of determining proper construction and scope of an exclusion clause, there are three issues to consider. First, there is what is known as the contra proferentem rule, which means that in the case of ambiguity of a clause, that ambiguity will be construed against the party seeking to rely on it. Second, clear language is required if you are going to attempt to exclude liability caused by negligence, given that this is a very serious exclusion. As I will discuss later, it is no longer possible to exclude liability for personal injury or death caused by negligence, so even the most clearly and unambiguously formulated clause will fail to achieve this. Third, there is a body of case law about what is called fundamental breach, with the argument that a clause which attempts to exclude liability for something which goes right to the heart of the contract will not be valid. This, following the case of Photo Production Securicor, it, it seems that this approach is now somewhat in remission, and a clearly drafted clause is unlikely to be struck down on the basis of the fundamental breach doctrine. If an exclusion clause has been successfully incorporated into a contract and, on the correct construction, covers the breach at issue, the final stage is to consider whether there are any statutory bases on which an exclusion clause might be struck down. There are three, three places you should consider here. The Unfair Contract Terms Act of 1977, the Unfair Terms in Consumer Contracts Regulations of 1999, and the Consumer Rights Act of 2015. The Unfair Contract Terms Act 1997, UCTA, was passed with the introduction that it is an act to impose further limits on the extent to which civil liability for breach of contract or for negligence or other breach of duty can be avoided. As you can tell from the language of further limits, UCTA is not the first piece of legislation which attempts to regulate limitations and exclusions of liability. It is, however, the first place that I suggest you start in your framework for considering statutory limitations. Section 2.1 of UCTA provides that a person cannot exclude or restrict his liability for personal injury or death caused by negligence. Simply cannot be excluded. Where a term purports to exclude um, liability for non-personal injury or damage caused by negligence. Section 2.2 of UCTA provides that it can be excluded, provided 
but the term satisfies the requirement of reasonableness. It's worth saying that, in terms of the definition of negligence, section 1 of UCTA provides a broad definition. It encompasses both contractual duties and certain duties of care on occupiers of land, as well as the common law tort of negligence. It is a broad duty. Where a party to a contract deals as a consumer, or on the other party's written standard terms, the other party cannot, by reference to any contract term, exclude or restrict liability in respect of the breach, or claim to be entitled to render a performance substantially different to that which was reasonably expected of him, or to render no performance at all, by reference to a contractual term, unless the term satisfies the requirement of reasonableness. This is in section 3 of ACTA. In a similar vein, at section 4, a person dealing as a consumer cannot be made to indemnify another person in respect of liability which that other person might incur for negligence or breach of contract, except where such a term satisfies the requirement of reasonableness. This prevents a dominant party from flipping around the impact of a breach requiring the consumer to pay, although it only prevents clauses which provide for recovery on an indemnity basis. What does it mean to deal as a consumer? This is dealt with in section 12 of the contract, and it's the situation in which a party neither makes the contract in the course of business, nor holds himself out as doing so. The other party does make the contract in the course of business. And in the case of a contract governed by the law of sale of goods or higher purchase, or by section 7 of UCTA, the goods passing under or in pursuance of the contract are of the type ordinarily supplied for private use or consumption. Take a look at the case of R&B Customs Brokers and United Dominion Trust and see what you think of the decision. It fundamentally permitted a business to fall within the construct of dealing as a consumer, and this was on the basis that the activity in question, buying a car, was not integral to the claimant's business. This seems a stretch too far to me, as it is not based on, on bargaining power or inequality, which would both seem to be perfectly reasonable bases for overriding the freedom to contract, but rather on the nature of the activity in question. But, like it or not, it is good law, and has been followed by the Court of Appeal in the case of Felder Roll. Implied warranties as to goods conformity to sample, or their quality or fitness for purpose, cannot be excluded by any contractual term against a party dealing as a consumer. I will cover this in detail in the podcast on consumer protection. As you've heard, some of the limitations imposed by UCTA are those where the term in question does not satisfy the requirement of reasonableness. At section 11, UCTA sets out the reasonableness test, and it is a genu general one. The test of reasonableness is that, in relation to a contractual term, is whether a term shall have been a fair and reasonable one to be included, having regard to the circumstances which were, or ought reasonably to have been, known to, or in the contemplation of, the parties when the contract was made. The burden of proof is on the party seeking to claim that the term in question meets the requirement of reasonableness. There is some guidance for determining reasonableness in the context of terms around consumer protection for sale and supply of goods and services. These are set out at Schedule 2 to UCTA, but other than this, the test is a very general one. Um, and because it's so general, there is great scope for a difference of opinion. It's not always easy to determine which way a court might rule on a particular issue. This is recognised by the House of Lords in the case of Mitchell and Finney Locke that a court will need to balance a whole range of consideration. In Smith and Eric Bush, the House of Lords set out four questions which, in the opinion of Lord Griffiths, must always be considered when trying to assess whether a term of a contract is reasonable. I think the first is whether the parties were of equal bargaining power. Second, in the case of advice, would it have been reasonably practical to obtain advice from an alternative source, taking into account the considerations of cost and time. Thirdly, how difficult is the task being undertaken 
for which liability is excluded. The more difficult the task, the more reasonable it's likely to be to try and limit or exclude liability. Fourthly, what are the practical consequences of the decision on the question of reasonableness? So there is some judicial guidance as to what courts are likely to consider in making a determination on reasonableness, but it is not a clear-cut issue. Moving away from ACTA, the second piece of legislation to consider is one deriving from Europe, and that is the Unfair Terms in Consumer Contracts Regulations 1999. Although there is a degree of overlap between the regulations and ACTA, the regulations are broader in terms of the protection which they afford to consumers. And, as the name says, they apply only to consumer contracts, being those between a seller or supplier and a consumer. A consumer for the purposes of the regulations is any natural person who, in contracts covered by these regulations, is acting for purposes which are outside his trade, business or profession. The requirement of a natural person excludes companies and other non-natural legal persons. What is an unfair term under the regulations? The basic test under the regulations is set out at Regulation 5.1. This is a contractual term which has not been individually negotiated, shall be regarded if un as unfair if, contrary to the requirement of good faith, it causes a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations arising under the contract to the detriment of the consumer. If the term has been individually negotiated, it falls outside the ambit of the regulations. But if it is not, one needs to look at whether the term causes a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations. Schedule 2 of the regulations contains an indicative and non-exhaustive list of the terms which may be regarded as unfair, and you should take a look at this. In Assessing whether a term is unfair or not, a broad range of matters are relevant, and these are set out in Regulation 6.1. Taking into account the nature of the goods or the services for which the contract was concluded, and by referring, at the time of conclusion of the contract, to all the circumstances attending the conclusion of the contract, and to all the other terms of the contract or of another contract on which it is dependent. However, provided that they are expressed in plain, intelligible language. The requirements of fairness do not apply to the main definition of the subject matter, for example, the item being solved, or the fairness of the price itself. You can't complain that something is too expensive and seek to rely on the regulations to support you. In this context, see the Supreme Court decision in Office of Fair Trading and Abbey National PLC, which held that overruling the Court of Appeal, fees for going into an overdraft with a bank fell within this restriction. The Supreme Court rejected the Court of Appeal's attempt to distinguish between core terms, which would have fallen within Regulation 6.2, and thus outside the scope of the fairless analysis, and ancillary terms, which would have been liable for an analysis for fairness. The Supreme Court held quite simply that if the term relates to price, it is outside the scope of the regulations. It is a requirement of the regulations um, that any term must be in a plain, intelligible language, and the regulations put onto a statutory basis uh, through Regulation 7 the principle of contra proferentum, interpreting ambiguous clauses against the reliant party. The third and final framework I would like you to consider is that of the Consumer Rights Act 2015. The Act consolidates various rules on consumer protection into one set central place, and this includes the rule on exclusion of liability. You will want to take a look at sections 31, 47 and 57, and in particular, Schedule 2. This has been quite a mammoth recording, and I expect that you will want to take some time to go over the materials and read the various pieces of legislation and the cases, and try and get your head around it. However, for all the detail which I've just discussed, remember the high-level principles, the framework for considering exclusion clauses and limitations of liability. The first step is to ask whether the exclusion clause is incorporated into the contract. If it's not, then neither party can rely on it. The second step is that if the clause is incorporated into the contract, you need to examine whether, on a correct construction, it covers the issue in question.
and thirdly if it is incorporated and if on a true construction it does cover the issue whether it falls within a statutory limitation on exclusion clauses preventing a party from relying on it. As you've heard there is a lot of detail under each of these headings but approach the analysis in this systematic manner and you should come out the other end with, with the right conclusion. The biggest difficulty with this area of law in my view is the fact that the issue of statutory limitations involves quite a considerable degree of subjectivity as to what is and is not reasonable and it is not easy to predict whether a court would decide that a particular term was or was not reasonable against the overall background of the deal.